But in Luke 23, 32 to 56. Two others, criminals, were also led away to be executed with him. When they arrived at the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and cast lots. The people stood watching and even the leaders kept scoffing. He saved others. Let him save himself if this is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also mocked him. They came offering him sour wine and said, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription was above him. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, Don't you even fear God, since you're undergoing the same punishment? We're punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three because the sun's light failed. The curtain of the sanctuary was split down the middle and Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. Saying this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what happened, he began to glorify God, saying, This man really was righteous. All the crowds that had gathered for this spectacle when they saw what had taken place went home, striking their chests. But all who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. There was a good and righteous man named Joseph, a member of the Sanhedrin, who had not agreed with their plan or action. He was from Arimathea, a Judean town, and was looking forward to the kingdom of God. He approached Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Taking it down, he wrapped it in fine linen and placed it in a tomb cut into the rock where no one had ever been placed. It was preparation day and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who'd come with him from Galilee followed along and observed the tomb and how his body was placed. Then they returned and prepared spices and perfumes and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What do you expect of Good Friday? What do you expect of the whole Easter weekend? For some, it's family time. For others, it's rest time, a holiday, a chance to travel. For some, it's the expectation of being lonely and perhaps sad yet again. Still others wonder why you'd call a day like today good. And for others, life just goes on as normal and the days just roll. What do you expect of Good Friday, of the whole Easter weekend? Luke writes this account so that we're actually encouraged to consider the expectations we have of the whole weekend, of Good Friday, of Easter Sunday, on a day like today, what do we expect as we confront the death of Jesus? Let me pray. Father, thanks for Luke. He was a good doctor who analysed, investigated and wrote copious notes. But we thank you even more for the bloke he wrote about, for Jesus, who is the good doctor come to bind up the brokenhearted. Father, please bring us before his death today, remembering what he's done, and please confront our expectations. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm at point two on the outline. Uh, Luke, as you've just heard me pray, is a Greek doctor. Uh, He trusts in Jesus. Uh, He's got a mate called Theo. 
Uh, Theo is a public servant in the Roman Empire. Uh, Theo does trust in Jesus, but his trust is starting to waver because there's a lot at stake for Theo. There's a lot at stake for a bloke in the Roman public service who says he follows Jesus. Uh, Luke wants to reassure Theo. So he carefully investigates the truth about Jesus. He goes back to the sources as any good doctor would do. He interviews eyewitnesses and then he constructs an orderly account of the life of Jesus for one purpose and one purpose only. Theo, everything you've heard about Jesus is certainly true. You can trust him. Now, at the time of his writing, and with all the resources at his disposal, Theo could have gone and investigated everything that Luke had said, couldn't he? When you've got the whole Roman public service at your fingertips, you can find any record, can't you? And so at the heart of what Jesus is doing is a public statement like those public records about his work. It actually comes from Jesus' first sermon in his hometown. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him and unrolling the scroll, Jesus found the place where it was written, Luke 4, 18. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Can you imagine a hometown boy coming back to Narrabri and preaching that? What marvellous news. And Jesus never wavered. He was very consistent in his mission. So questioned later on in Luke chapter 5, verse 31, about his dinner companions and his social group, Jesus replied to them, the healthy don't need a doctor, but the sick do. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus is here to deal with a broken world. And at the heart of the brokenness is people like you and me who are sick. Sick with sin. Jesus makes clear why he is here. And once he is recognized as the one sent by God, he then talks about how he's going to do it in Luke chapter 9, verse 21 saying the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the eldest chief priests, scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Jesus is clear about his job. I've come to deal with the brokenness of the world, not with a band-aid, not with a ritual, but with a sacrifice. I've come to deal with the root cause of this thing called sin, by taking it and all of its ugliness on me for people like you. Since the attitude and action that says, I am God and God is not. Sin makes all of us enemies of God. It places us under his right judgment of death. We can do nothing about it, but God does. He sends Jesus to deal with that brokenness so that what should fall on us falls on him. Luke writes so clearly and carefully to reassure Theo that this is what Jesus is about, and it is true. So when Luke comes to talk about the death of Jesus, he wants Theo to know the certainty of what took place as well as the certainty of the purpose. I hope you've got Luke 23 open there. Make sure you've got it there as we work our way through it. The certainty of the event is very clear. Uh, Luke writes, so that Theo and us are there, right there in verse 32. Uh, We're invited to stand next to the road as these three men are led out to be crucified. Uh, When you get over to verse 44, Luke writes in such a way that we're there. And at that time, we all look at our watches and we go, that's the hour. And then we hear a loud voice as Jesus gives up his spirit. Luke writes so that we watch with the women as the body is taken down and laid in a certain unused tomb. And we remember where that tomb is. Uh, Luke writes in such a way that the historical detail is woven through and we stand there at those moments. 
But Luke also writes in such a way that the purpose of Jesus' certain death is also made clear. And we're not going to cover all of this, but it's really striking what Luke weaves through this account. As Jesus is led up with two criminals, we're meant to recall that reading from Isaiah that said he was counted amongst the outcasts, the outlaws. He was buried with the criminals. As his clothes are divided by lot, we remember Psalm 22, verse 18. As he's offered something bitter to drink, we remember the same poem. As he is nailed to a cross, we remember the same poem, Psalm 22, verse 16. As he gives up his life, he even quotes scripture then, doesn't he? Psalm 31, verse 5. And in case you missed all of those references, you're then given a picture, aren't you? That massive curtain in the temple, torn in half as a symbol of the thing that separates us from God and it's ripped down because Jesus has dealt with sin. The death of Jesus is certain. The purpose of the death of Jesus is certain. And Jesus certainly expected this on Good Friday. He'd predicted it precisely a number of times. He knew what God had planned hundreds of years before when Isaiah wrote. Jesus was in complete control of it. Did anyone take his life? No one took his life. He gave it up. Luke wants to ensure that Theo knows the certainty of Jesus' death, its purpose, and that Jesus expected this to happen. I'm at point three on the outline. But he also wants Theo and us to examine our own expectations of this event. Luke does it in a really particular way. At various points in the narrative, He does something different in his writing. So we are suddenly transported into the story, into the events, and made to stand there. You can see a bit of it there on your outline. He does it in verse 32. So that we stand there with the crowd and watch these three men go out. He does it in verse 44. So that we look at our watches and we notice the time and what's going on in the natural world. And we hear the death. Oh, what's that old African-American song? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? And what does Luke want us to say? Yeah, I, I was there. I stood and watched the procession. I stood and I watched nature. I stood and I looked at my watch. I stood and I heard that cry. But Luke doesn't want us just to be dispassionate observers. He wants us to absorb these events, as one author describes it. He wants us to absorb it in such a way that we explore our own expectations, our own expectations of a moment like this. And he does it by placing us with various groups. The first group is there in verse 35. The people stood watching, even the leaders kept scoffing. He saved others. Let him save himself if this is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him. They came offering him sour wine and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourselves. Come and stand with the scoffers. Their expectations are clear, aren't they? What's going to happen today? Why is this a good day? This is a good day because we killed Jesus. Jesus is powerless. Jesus is useless. Jesus is a public spectacle to make fun of. Jesus is empty. Jesus has nothing. Jesus is to be ridiculed and ignored and laughed at. Even the bloke hanging up there with him, one of them, joins in. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. At the moment where that man's about to go into the abyss of death, what what does he think is a good thing to do? To ridicule the bloke on the cross next to him. That's a common reaction to Jesus, isn't it? To sneer and to scoff, especially to the reality of his death. 
the expectation that we've got rid of him. He was a little pesky and he got a bit of a crowd, but we, we dealt with him. We've emptied all of his words. We've defied all of his teachings. We've removed his power and substance by killing him. Perhaps you've been one of those scoffers. Perhaps you're still one of them. Perhaps you're here today under duress, a habit, maybe even a tradition. Luke wants you to stand there with the other scoffers and consider your expectations of this death. The second group is the group of mourners. They're there in verse 47. When the centurion saw what happened, he began to glorify God, saying, this man really was righteous. All the crowds that had gathered for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, went home striking their chests. But all who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. This group is seized by the sadness of the moment. Their expectations are those of mourners. The crowd that's travelled with Jesus from Galilee, their hopes are shattered, aren't they? I suspect for the centurion, he's thinking, I think we got this one wrong. I think we've got this one wrong. I think that too is a common reaction to Jesus, isn't it? Here is a good man wrongly treated. Here is a good man wrongly killed. And in that sense, I think the mourners fear God, but don't quite grasp more than the sadness. And that too is common amongst people today, isn't it? He was a good man, a very good man. He said some very insightful things, things that confronted social evils. But isn't it sad that he died? Isn't, he sad? Isn't it sad that they killed him? And then there's the third group. Well, it's not a group, is it? It's actually just one man. He's there in verse 40. But the other answered, the other criminal, rebuking him, don't, don't you even fear God since you're undergoing the same punishment? We're, we're punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man, this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, I assure you, today you'll be with me in paradise. What, is that? what does that man recognise? That man recognises his own nature, doesn't he? I, I deserve to be hanging here. That life of crime, that life of rebellion, that life of... I'm getting everything I deserve. But what that man doesn't expect is to look there at the centre of the trio and see that man. Why would that man be up here? That man who has done nothing wrong for the criminal, the death of Jesus, is completely unexpected. And as he recognises his own nature, and as he recognises the fact that Jesus is there with him, this man repents, doesn't he? This man turns back to Jesus. This man has lived a life where he has been boss, where he has been God, where he has made the rules. At this moment, knowing he receives what he deserves, he turns to the bloke next to him, doesn't he? He turns back to the bloke that he's ignored. And at the heart of that is a recognition of Jesus. Even a criminal would have heard of Jesus in those days. He knows who Jesus is. He knows that he is from God. He knows that he has committed no sin. And so as he turns to Jesus, as he recognises Jesus, as he repents, he makes a request. Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I've really been struck this week how much is in those few words. Who else in the Gospels calls Jesus Jesus? Can you think of anyone else? It's a remarkably personal moment. Not, not Lord, not teacher, not rabbi, Jesus. Do you notice that this man actually recognises that the death of Jesus is the crowning of Jesus? 
when you come into your kingdom, Jesus. This man doesn't expect Jesus to stay dead, does he? But Jesus is about to go and be crowned. And he recognises that his only hope for life after death lies with the man about to be king, the man who didn't deserve to die. This man throws himself upon the mercy, the kindness, the regard of the king. And in that man's request, Luke helps Theo and us understand a summary of Jesus' work. In Jesus' death is the only hope for those who think they are God. In Jesus' death, the sin that desires to be God is dealt with. In Jesus' death is the exact way God promised to deal with our rebellion. In Jesus' death, the king of the world is crowned because he takes on the greatest enemy of the whole universe. And then Jesus answers him. We know that answer, don't we? Verse 43, and he said to him, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. What an answer. On this very dark day today, when an innocent man dies with criminals, the innocent man saves criminals. Today, this very dark day, Jesus comes into his kingdom. He takes on death for those who are his enemies. And he offers eternal life to those who turn to him. Today, this very day, Jesus achieves what he said in that sermon three years before. There is freedom for the captive. Today, on this very dark day, Jesus saves criminals, standing in for them. Both the criminal and Jesus expected to die on that day, didn't they? Both of them. But the one who deserved to die is saved by the one who died for him. The one without sin dies for those who are sinners, alongside them, taking judgment upon himself. Now, that's not a common stance in our world, is it? Our world is usually divided between the scoffers and the mourners. But here a criminal brings us to meet the king. The king crowned by his death. The king who doesn't deserve to die, bringing eternal life to those who do. The king who hears repentance and answers the request for mercy. Is that your expectation of Jesus today? Is that where you stand or hang? in this account of the death of Jesus. What are you expecting this Easter? What are you expecting? Luke wants us to know the certainty of these events, the certainty of Jesus' death, the certainty of its purpose, the certain expectation that Jesus had, that on this day he will die in order to make the captives free, taking judgment upon himself. No mistake. No accident, no miscalculation. So where do we stand with our expectations? Do we stand with the scoffers and those who sneer? Do we stand with the mourners engulfed with sadness and nothing else? Or do we hang with the criminal who recognised his own nature, the nature of Jesus, who repents and who requests the help of Jesus and hears these words, today, I assure you, you will be with me in paradise.